everyone. Welcome everyone to our fourth hearing of the year. Today we're going to examine gun violence prevention and enforcement efforts. There's an epidemic of gun violence in our nation and this subcommittee has a key role to play in the urgently needed response. As we oversee the federal law enforcement agencies tasked with overseeing gun dealers, investigating gun crimes, and running our background check system, among other things. That is why I'm pleased to welcome our two witnesses today, Thomas Brandon, the Deputy Director and Head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, also known as ATF, and Christine Havlison, the Acting Assistant Director for Criminal Justice Information Services, or CJIS, pronounced CJUS, at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. CJUS, among other things, operates the National Instant Criminal Background Check, more commonly known as NICS, pronounced as NICS. Both agencies play a crucial role in preventing gun crimes before they occur the investigating them once they do. You also have a key role in the policy making and the public to better understand how guns fall into wrong hands, how our government oversees our nation's firearms, dealers and buyers, and what we need to prioritize. Both agencies also have a key role in working with state and local enforcement in these goals. There are a large number of issues that have raised concerns on both sides of the aisle in recent years, from oversight over federally licensed gun dealers to loopholes in our background check system, to delayed denials to gun trafficking, to the need to more rapidly trace the sources of crime guns, the list goes on and on. Unfortunately, we in Congress have too often failed just you just as well. Given the diversity and seriousness of your missions, we have too often underfunded some of your critical functions. Right now, for instance, the New York City Police Department has more than 39,000 officers and more than 19,000 administrative staff. As of 2019, the ATF has a total of 5,109. Given your responsibilities, I think it is safe to say that an increase in staffing is solely needed. On the next side, funding has grown over time to help states maintain and update their background check databases and continued NICS funding is vital to ensuring that the background check database is accurate. Lastly, we also cannot discuss enforcement of our gun laws without also mentioning previous legislative actions taken by Congress that have impeded ATF's ability to prevent and investigate gun violence. This committee, unfortunately, has a long history of interfering in some common sense policies to ensure that the ATF can, enact, can act in <coughs> ways that are effective and efficient. Hopefully we will get a chance to discuss the impact of those choices today. I represent a community that is far too often subject to gun violence, like so many members do, not only in this committee, but in Congress. We are not far from the issue of illegal guns that have moved from a legitimate federally licensed firearms dealer to an illegitimate source. So far this year, we have had 29 shootings in the Bronx. I think we can all agree that this is too many and that we need to act to prevent this from happening. Gun crimes happen all over our nation and not a day goes by without a firearms related death. This violence has a serious impact on our neighborhoods not only the serious physical and emotional impact on families, but also the psychological impact on the broader community at large. Two weeks ago, the House took a step toward addressing this epidemic. I look forward to working with the agencies here today to determine what steps we can take next. So we welcome you again, and with that, I recognize Mr. Adderholt, my partner. Brendan, ATF currently inspects approximately 8% of all federal firearms licensees, or FFLSs, each year. What funding and personnel would you need to increase that to 20%? And does ATF have a target for what percentage should be inspected each year? If not, what percentage 
would you recommend as a matter of best practice? And let me tell you that I, I've been in Congress quite a long time and on this committee quite a long time. It's very rare to have the chairman or the ranking member or anyone say, how much money do you need? Uh, it's usually you're asking too much. So uh, uh, if you can tell us. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. And hey, we'll take whatever you give us, you know. As <laughs> for, uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, as far as uh, our industry operation investigators, we have about, say, 850, but really about 684 are actually doing the inspections. Each one, uh, uh, they work their tails off. They do about 45, 40 to 50 per year. And uh, one of the things with these inspections is that in the firearms industry, about 50% of the FFLs, the federal firearms licensee, are, are new within the last five years. So these IOIs, when someone establishes a business, we want them to be successful. And the IOIs personally meet with them, go over uh, the regulations and the administrative documents that they need. So that eats up a lot of the time. Uh, we can always do more with more uh, uh, with IOIs. And to answer your question of um, uh, our, uh, ROIs, uh, if we had a few hundred more, could we do more? Uh, sure. To try to maximize with whatever resources were allocated, we are um, using a, um, very, a new type of way of like a comp stat with our inspections to go after uh, the people that are worthy of inspection. And we have an oversight at the headquarters level so that when the field divisions, each field division will give us their uh, plan for the year, their domain assessment, and uh, we will have headquarters review to make sure they are inspecting the proper targets. You know, they, I've heard it referred to as, you know, the, the troubled dealers that we don't have attention on. And I have to say, I've been in my position um, seven and a half years now, and we have improved, and we continue to improve as we should, as any organization should, be continuous process improvement, but to, uh, I would say we would need a few hundred more industry operation investigators uh, to accomplish the uh, percent that you uh, recommended. A couple of hundred would bring you to 20 percent, you said. Uh, uh, with, uh, uh, as best as I can answer right now, sir, with, uh, 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 yes, I would be comfortable in saying that that would help us. Uh, obviously have more progress, but uh, I believe that would be accurate. Uh, last summer, the New York Times did an investigation of ATF's inspections of gun dealers that revealed that supervisors downgraded recommendations to revoke these gun dealers' licenses. How many of these recommendations to revoke licenses get downgraded each year? Uh, sir, I'll get back to, to the committee with the specific numbers, but it will explain the process, and it was a process to be fair that you didn't have inconsistencies applied around the country de depending on who the, uh, the, uh, the DIO, the Director of Industry Operations was. There's one for each of the 25 field divisions. So it comes up and is reviewed and the whole thing is that we have, uh, we address the issue and that there is national oversight to ensure there is consistency and fairness applied to the process. Let me ask you another question. Several years ago, Congress prohibited ATF from requiring the federal firearms licensees conduct physical inventories of their, promise, of their premises. To what extent does this restriction impede ATF's ability to inspect the FFLS? Well, sir, uh, uh, we follow the laws that you pass and, uh, the, and the funds you give us to do that. So we operate within the, uh, uh, the confines of that. I will say there's a, a program where the FFLs have been receptive and it's when they were uh, uh, victims of a burglary or a robbery. And we respond as an integrated team of ATF special agents and ATF industry operations investigators and along with the local police. And a key component is that is helping the FFL determine the inventory, the firearms that were being stolen so they could be entered into NCIC that the FBI uh, controls. And we know from those burglaries and robberies that those are no, no longer lawful commerce, they're crime guns, and they're gonna be used to shoot people. And most likely the people that are gonna come up against them are the brave men and women uh, on patrol in uniform. Thank you, Ms. Evanson. I understand NICS relies on three main databases, the NIC Crime Database, the Interstate Identification Index System, and the NICS Index, which includes records not in the other two databases particularly from states and other agencies to include mental health records. An important point is that states provide their information voluntarily. 
Would you agree that it is critical to have timely and complete information from the states to ensure NICS has what it needs to make accurate and timely assessments of gun purchases and eligibility? So it sounds like you know our process very, very well. So yes, the firearms background Somebody checks. Somebody does on yeah, staff, yes, for sure. Yes, there you go. <laughs> So for, as I had said in my opening statement, the firearms background checks are only as good as the information we have at the time that we have it. So the, the operator, when they're reviewing it, when the, we call them legal instrument examiners, when they review the next request that comes in, the background check that comes, they're going off the information they have at that point in time and then request further information if we need it. So the more timely the information, the quicker we can make a decision and move forward with the process. And what records do we need to get state or federal partners to improve submission of re relevant health and other records? So, uh, regular, and so I'm, I'm just confused. What records do we need to get states or federal partners to improve submission of relevant health and other records? So when, when you're going through it, uh, the Fixed NICS Act was a big help to us with getting the dispositions into the system and having working through that and having the states and the grants that were funded by DOJ to help the states get through that and we're still working through that process to get the relevant records that we need into the system. Let me just ask a question that I don't have here. What is the, uh, what would you say is the morale uh, of the folks that work uh, in your agency? Because uh, a lot of times we hear that people feel that their their hands are tied on some of the things they want to do. What, what's the sense? If I you know, was to talk to employees at ATF, for instance, would I find people who say, we could be doing more, but we're not allowed to, or we can't do more? What would I find? Um, sir, I, I believe uh, morale in the field, uh, I, the men and women that are running and gunning, going after the trigger pullers and the traffickers providing those trigger pulls with the gun, um, they, they do it with passion. You know, it's, uh, it's not who they became, it's who they always been. It's, it's in their DNA to go after and do this type of work, and I'm sure it's the same in the FBI and all the other law enforcement organizations. But I would, I would not be doing my job up here of the, the continual compression of our budget. Um, you know, our budget where the costs have um, gone up, even though our budget gone, has gone up, the costs have gone up higher. And to be candid with you, I've been an agent for, thir for ATF 30 years. Um, the cost of conducting criminal investigations has gone up just with the, everybody has a cell phone on their life. So the costs for digital media exploitation, social media warrants and so forth, and I know we're not alone, except uh, the one thing that they would maybe feel is that we're uh, underappreciated uh, for the job that these brave men and women uh, do. We're the smallest component in DOJ and law enforcement, FBI, DEA, Marshals, and then ATF. But uh, regardless of that, I ask them, I attend every academy class uh, mostly, and I ask them why they come on the job, and they come from other agencies. And, uh, uh, we even had a couple from the FBI, you know, and then hey. the, uh, <laughs> yeah, we love stealing people, the Secret Service, everybody. You and would take people from the FBI? Oh, we have class, yeah. But the, the reason I say the reason I say that is, uh, and I'm, uh, uh, we have a great relationship with the FBI, uh, is the, is the mission. It, it's they want to go after, to your point, you're in the Bronx, it, they want to go after the people that are hurting people. You know, these are good Americans that are saying, hey, let us go after the trigger pullers and the traffickers. And I know from personal experience, there's nothing like locking up a killer. Thank you, Mr. Allenhall. The 2016 Justice IG audit of the handling of firearms purchase denials noted a big drop in prosecution since FY 2013. A recent JAO, uh, GAO report requested by this subcommittee found that DOJ rarely prosecuted individuals who falsely, uh, who falsify information such as not disclosing felony convictions. In 2017, of 112,090 denials, ATF referred 12,710 for further investigation, resulting in only 12 prosecutions. In contrast, GAO found three states that received, reviewed their denials that, uh, that had had a higher proportion of referrals and a high conviction rate. GAO recommended ATF assess the use of warnings to applicants who 
This represented their eligibility for gun ownership rather than pursue prosecution of lieu of prosecution. Deputy Director Brandon, has ATF taken action on these recommendations? Yes, sir. In fact, it was a year ago yesterday that uh, then Attorney General Sessions sent a memo out to all his U.S. attorneys across the country, which incidentally, uh, they've been crushing it with going on with crime, firearms prosecutions. But he addressed that specific issue about lie and try, and that uh, there have been some uh, U.S. attorneys in certain areas of the country that have increased that. The numbers are still relatively small, but the percentage look like it's high percentage increase, but I'd like to get back to the committee with those specific numbers uh, to answer your question uh, regarding standard denials, which is the firearm didn't transfer, the person um, uh, lied on the form, and um, the U.S. Attorney's Office prioritized their resources to uh, maximize prosecutions of all the cases they have. Well, that's, that's the thing. I can tell you that in conversations amongst members of Congress, not in a formal setting, one of the concerns is the, the low prosecution rate as we interpret and as many in the press interpret it. So did I ask you the right question or is there something else no, we could be doing? No, sir, I can just show you, like say um, that, uh, say someone has three violent felonies or a, a misdemeanor crime or domestic violence and we see that there's a standard denial and they didn't get that. We'll work with the U.S. attorneys, and to be honest, the cuffs have been slapped on a few of them. You know, recently I've, I've gotten them through our notification system. So it has improved, uh, and I give uh, Attorney General Sessions credit for uh, cracking the whip with the U.S. attorneys, and they're moving, you know. And could you tell us to what extent your division, uh, your divisions use warnings in denial cases? Yes, sir. I mean, um, uh, and this goes into the regulatory process, um, you know, ATF, we want people to be uh, successful in their business. They're operating legal businesses with lawful commerce, but we can't be a captured component of our regulatory component. So uh, unless something is really egregious, like as far as a, a warning uh, letter or a warning con uh, uh, conference, it's progressive to try to get them in compliance. But if they don't and they fail to do that, we'll go after their license, and we've done that, and that's where we have a uh, – a national look at that so we're consistent where um, one business person says hey I was treated differently because uh, you know I was in Alabama and another was in Pennsylvania so that's why it was brought up to the national level to be uh, uh, fair to these uh, business people now the GAO report also showed a patchwork of policies where each ATF field office and each US attorney's office had differing standards for investigating and prosecuting individuals who falsify information on their applications and referring cases to state and local authorities. How can we do a better job coordinating these efforts? Should we have someone overseeing these policies to ensure we're all rowing in the same direction? Sir, uh, one of the things which uh, we established with myself and my team is that every year, the special agent charged for the field division and whatever judicial districts he or she has, has to certify that there's the, uh, what the U.S. Attorney will accept for these standard uh, denial cases. And I think that's, uh, you know, been helpful. And the other thing, working, you know, with uh, getting the information from the FBI, collaborating, is how can we um, share this information with state fusion centers? So it can be of benefit because you say, hey, you may not want to prosecute this guy, but say he's a, a gang member, you know, and, and whatever. Hey, he's trying to buy a gun. It, it can be intel that can be used. So. That's how uh, in, in past committees I've been asked that question. We went back and worked as a team. And I really think that's a, a good way of saying, instead of letting the information sit on standard denials, you know, if they're not going to be prosecuted, how do we share that in intelligence capacity and that maximizes public safety? And that's how we've approached it. Now, do we know if different U.S. attorneys have different standards? Uh, sir, I'll have to get back to you. I was going through a bunch. Uh, it, I believe just my experience, I think there's 93 uh, judicial districts. I think it would be a statistical improbability to say you got 93 U.S. attorneys who are usually, whatever your Democrat Republic, they're usually spirited people, and that they have to be consistent across the lines because they're all addressing different things. And uh, I know you know that, sir, with all your experience. Okay, here's a question you love to be asked. Would additional resources enable ATF to pursue more prosecutions of individuals who falsify or misrepresent their status on Form 4473, which is a firearms transactions record. 
Uh, yes, sir. Obviously, more resources would uh, lead to uh, uh, potentially, but uh, and again, it all goes back um, to what gets prosecuted. And uh, with our limited resources, to be candid, uh, I've been saying if we're not in step with the U.S. Attorney, we're out of step with him or her because we don't want to waste our time investigating something that's not going to get prosecuted. So you know, front load it. You know, work as a team, work with our partners, and have maximum value to the American taxpayer to say, hey, go, go after the violent people that are wreaking havoc, particularly um, in the inner cities and, and uh, other areas of the country. Uh, I don't want to leave out rural areas, but uh, uh, we could do more uh, with more, sir. And then, uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I, I needed, I believe I said what I said to Mr. Case uh, on behalf of the men and women of ATF, who I'm very proud of. Firearm retrieval is a term used by NICS for the action recommended after a background check is unresolved within the three business day time frame, and an FFL, FFL proceeds with a firearms transfer, but subsequently learns that the request should have been denied. The NICS section then notifies ATF that a prohibited person is in possession of a firearm and ATF can undertake action to retrieve the firearm. In 2017, 6,004 referrals for retrieval were made to the ATF, but the NICS section and ATF assessed that in 1,140 of these cases, the transfer was under undetermined. What does transfer, what does that mean? Transfer undetermined. Uh, sir. sir, I think it is, is we'll get um, uh, the information from uh, the FBI saying, hey, the firearms transferred, it's a delayed denial. The branch that uh, is in Martinsburg, uh, West Virginia, that looks at this for ATF will have all the documents for each judicial district to say, look at the criminal history. And uh, like, here's what I'm fairly confident in saying. Say the guy had a dope conviction of under 25 grams of cocaine in 1980, nothing else. Would the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecute it? I'd be 99.9% .9 accurate, absent any other intelligence, that uh, it would say, hey, refer that to the division to be looked at to inv investigate it because that's the filter. Because there's such a volume, you have to have, it's, it's a, a prudent step. But say it comes back going, hey, guess what? This guy has a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. He whooped the hell out of his... Uh, wife or, or a former partner and everything like that, and that was only 12 months ago or six months ago, get that thing to the division, you know, and let's go get that gun from that guy. And uh, the U.S. attorneys, uh, again, they when you have that type of threat to public safety, uh, um, they'll go after them, but those, those are, that's the type of filter show that's happened while the numbers go down to what goes to the field. One last part to this. Does ATF have a responsibility to confirm that a prohibited person has not taken possession of a firearm in such cases? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, the delayed denial will, will indicate that they did take possession of it, and then we'll work to make sure that, like I said, they can return it to the gun shop to turn it over to a third party that's not prohibited and not cohabitating with them, or that we'll go and uh, get the firearm from them. Thank you. Mr. Idaho, <clears throat> I admit uh, the guilt of having tried to uh, invent a new word. The word is undetermined, but that has actually brought us to yet another dilemma we have, is that we still don't know what undetermined, transfer undetermined means. Does it mean uh, the fact of the transfer, or does it mean eligibility of the purchaser? I mean, what does transfer undetermined mean? We don't want to leave this hearing not knowing what that means. So just from the FBI's perspective on that question, when we have a disposition, when we have a delay queue disposition come back and then we're able to make the determination that that person should have been a deny and then we refer it over to ATF. If it's after that three day time window from the four to 30 days, they had the ability to purchase a weapon during those four to 30 days. At day 31, they have to come back in and reapply. Okay, so from the 31 to 88 days. In that four to 30 days, when we refer to ATF, we don't know if they've gotten a weapon or not. We can't tell if the sale occurred or not. 
So in that 6,000, uh, it's not that all 6,000 got weapons. They just had the ability to get weapons and to the point of some of some of our partners working with some of the big gun sellers, they will not sell if you're still in that delay queue, right? So some, some of those 6,000 may not have been people who fully got weapons. Sir, on delayed denials, we don't leave anything undetermined. If it comes from the FBI and it looks like they have gotten a firearm, uh, we track it uh, by month. I get briefed monthly with my executive team and there has to be a resolution. Oftentimes there can be uh, problems with obtaining the court documents which frustrates the FBI, rightfully so, and even with us having more time than th uh, three business days, uh, we can say, hey, 30 days, 60 days, we're still trying to retrieve these uh, records, but we don't leave anything undetermined and that's tracked uh, monthly and briefed up to me. Previous ATF reports have indicated that nearly 60% of guns used in crimes can be associated with only 1% of federally licensed firearm dealers. Uh, do you think that the ratio is still accurate? Does the ATF know who the troublesome gun, deal gun dealers are? And what does the ATF do to make sure that these uh, dealers are subject to additional oversight and enforcement? Uh, sir, it's a great question, and as I mentioned, Earlier, uh, we have uh, continuous process improvement. This is one of the areas that we can improve. In fact, uh, just three weeks ago or so, I was briefed on uh, how we're going to have better oversight, oversight at the national level to say the division may say these are our problem problematic uh, federal firearms licensees that we need to inspect. And uh, I don't know if you're f uh, familiar with the term CompStat. It started at NYPD, but it's using data to question people's decisions and modeling. And so we using a new computer product with analytics to question these assumptions. And from, uh, I really think it's gonna take even at ATF at a more precise way of going after to what you're saying, these, you know, the, the dealers that are really uh, not following the law and uh, making <coughs> and diverting lawful commerce into the black market where they become crime guns. One last question, and it's almost a fun question except that it isn't. It's a very sad question, a new threat. The whole issue of 3D printed guns, uh, what kind of a threat does, uh, do you see? Uh, and what should law enforcement and Congress consider going, doing to address the threat? So I know I dealt with this a few years ago. It was the Undetectable Firearms Act that was renewed. And it was, uh, I think it was called the Liberator Firearm, piece of plastic, 3D printed, but it, you have to, to be compliant with the law, have a piece of metal that can be detected through like a TSA security uh, machine uh, walking through. Um, the threat we didn't see is maybe gang members, you know, doing this, but the threat to, um, you know, public officials or, you know, for any type of assassinations that you would be undetected and reassembled and so forth. The uh, what we see are self-made, unserialized firearms, which are uh, legal to do. Uh, it's not illegal to make your own firearm and not serialize it as long as you're not in the business of selling guns. Uh, I had a briefing where our divisions in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Miami are seeing an uptick in this, in particular with gang members. Uh, one of these self-made, unserialized firearms was used in a school sh uh, community college shooting a few years ago. And so um, they, uh, they're not necessarily uh, 3D printing, but going to do these uh, uh, legal way of, uh, and this person I believe was prohibited, so he made his own gun, which the part he bought is not regulated, and they can make some minor modifications now and then uh, get uh, unregulated parts like the barrel, the upper receiver, assemble it, and um, that's a, a threat to public safety. That's something we're looking at. Uh, I suspect it's one we're going to be looking at a lot because it's, uh, it's available to a lot of people and it creates yet another problem for all of us to deal with. Sir, I, I mean, uh, you have people saying you have hobbyists that are legitimately, you know, I mean, I, I, I like guns. Um, and they're hobbyists that like making their own guns, but it also opens it up for people that are prohibited that aren't going to go in and, and to an FFL and go through an FBI background check, NICS check, and then say, hey, get this, three holes, drew it, get these parts, slap it, I got my own gun, nobody knows the difference. And we have a number of shootings that uh, they're involved in. Thank you. Joining us today, it's, it's been very informative and uh, uh, we're on your side. We, we know the work you need to do. We want you to do more of it. 
We want you to have an opportunity to do it better, uh, as I'm sure you want to improve on it. And uh, as time goes on, as we get this bill ready, we will keep that in mind, and our conversations will continue. So thank you so much, and this meeting is adjourned.